Hello legends and super legends, welcome to Velo Harmony. In today's video, I want to go along the theme of talking about, the, you know, we've been talking about the keys to cycling improvement, managing your cycling, burnout, and so forth. And I wanted to make this video for our archives in the weight management section. I've gotten a lot of questions from legends and other people about how much cycling you need to do to lose weight. It's not a magic number. So you need to think in terms of when you, when you put on weight, you're not paying attention to it. Your lifestyle has changed. Somehow, maybe you got a job where you're working more hours and then your activity goes down and you continue to eat normally. Whether your diet's perfect or not, doesn't matter. There is no such thing. You know, I believe that you eat what you crave because your body kind of tells you what you need. But let's say everything else being the same as far as the intake of food, when your activity goes down and you're more sedentary, you will gain weight because you're not burning the calories that you're taking in unless you adjust the consumption, their volume. But a lot of times when you get really busy, people tend to skip meals and then we binge because when you get hungry, you don't make good food choices. So there's a combination. So if you want to lose weight in cycling specifically, I believe the key is that you don't focus on how many calories you need to burn or how much cycling you need to do. You need to keep, keep your mind on the fact that There we go. I think the mute was on. I hope this is better. Welcome, everybody. Uh, thanks, Rob. I appreciate it. The um, We want to start today with uh, Robert had put a question on um, the channel talking about uh, riding on the shoulder. <laughs> so, um, And I replied extensively because I share your viewpoint 100%. Um, the shoulders are not designed for bicycling. In fact, uh, we live in one of the least bicycle-friendly cities I've encountered in my travels. I mean, I, I used to do a job where I went like 50 weeks out of the year all over the world, all the cities in the U.S., whatever. And really... Let's see, like, for example, I would say, number one, the Netherlands sets a trend that a lot of cities need to follow. Houston is among the worst because uh, even for pedestrians, if you, walk, if you try to walk, like, in Houston, anywhere, there are no sidewalks for the most part. I'm not talking about the trails that they have, like, in our woodlands areas and so forth. Even in our area here, Tomball or whatever, we're somewhat rural so we've got like everything car centric. Houston is a sprawl. It just the city just gobbled up everything. So they don't really have uh, good facilities for non car travel, and and everybody kind of feels like they have to own a car. That that's the way this city is made out. There was no plan to accommodate other modes of transportation, and it's unfortunate. But that's one of the things here, you know. So even though on the books we are allowed to use the road, the road is not very friendly towards bicycles because we're sharing it with other faster, bigger, heavier moving vehicles. And our vehicle is more vulnerable. So they have not given a lot of thought to separating the bicycle traffic extensively from the other. You know, they're trying to do a little bit here and there, but they've got a long way to go compared to other cities. And, you know, and they're not the only one. There are a lot of cities that don't really accommodate. You'll be walking and, it, and the sidewalk just ends. Like, you know, and then you'll see the well-worn path in the grass 
or you'll have like a little bridge with nowhere for the pedestrian to go. So you're just on the edge of the road walking next to these cars zooming by. So, yeah, uh, we are not relegated to the shoulder. We only use the shoulder when it's safe and smooth and it and it's, you know, accommodates us because we don't really like sharing the road with cars because they're not paying attention. And, you know, and we don't want to tangle with cars because we will lose most more often than not, you know. Uh, Paul Ilunga is here. Good to see you, my brother. But uh, so what I was saying is that, yes, when we ride in the woodlands, this is part of the answer that I gave Robert. And I've, I've answered that. I've mentioned that on videos and other films we've made. When you see one of us riding on those shoulders, it's because we want to chat with somebody. But the shoulders are uneven. So you have to pay attention. They're not as smooth as the road. And they have more ruts. And then at every intersection, the curb from the other intersection juts out into the shoulder. We've had members of our group that rides with us, like Dan uh, um, Dan crashed and hurt his shoulder probably a couple of years ago now because he was not paying attention. He looked back for traffic, and one of those curbs that was jutting out caught his front wheel while he was riding on that shoulder. So whenever we can, if the shoulder is wide enough in the woodland, we'll use it. It's quieter. I rode today. I used it myself. But when I'm riding solo, the small shoulders that you usually see, they're about maybe two feet. I don't use that in the woodlands. I just use the road. You know, it's just better. Like you said, it's easier. It's more comfortable. Less attention is required because you're not looking for ruts and uneven pavement. So you just make that judgment wherever you ride. You know, that that's that's what you kind of have to do. Because we need more bicycle facilities. We shouldn't be in the mode where you have to have a car, but we live in a city to where it's required to get anywhere. Because, you know, they, they don't make it very convenient to walk. You know, a lot of our drives are not very far. You know, maybe three kilometers. That's about, what, five miles? That's the average drive. We don't drive very far unless you work across town and you're commuting to work. But a lot of times, just to go to the, the local Walmart or whatever. In fact, our neighborhoods are set up to where every neighborhood has a local grocery and something nearby. So really, we should be able to accommodate pedestrians and cyclists better than we have done. We have not just we have not chosen to invest property properly in that infrastructure. That's that's the unfortunate part, because we're laid up to where you know we're set up to where. You can go to the local grocery on your bike or walk there or whatever. It's probably better for us all around. And, you know, so I wanted to kind of open with that to just let Robert know, yeah, I feel your pain. That's the same thing we deal with. Because I do use my bike more than I use my car because I'm not commuting to an office every morning. So, you know, KJL, welcome. Welcome. We, we started out talking about, you know, just safety, riding smart, and the fact that our cities, unfortunately, are not set up to accommodate cycling, you know, and, and pedestrians and other non-car transportation like they can be. It's just a matter of the willingness to do so. <clears throat> so Patrick said, I was disturbed by the guy who drifted out of the traffic on the last ride. You guys are patient. I can't let that stuff to see. Yeah, exactly. Uh, th you're talking about Michael. Um, like you, I've already I've spoken to him because um, he has stopped riding. The, 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 the group we ride, we just kind of hook up with them. You guys see us chasing up the groups and so forth, and we go to Crust Pizza. It's not my group, so I can't really enforce uh you know anything but uh i've spoken to michael i've filmed michael several times doing stuff like that and and this week when he did that i was like you know he continued to do that he's riding with a different group because this week the group we hooked up with was paul h's group the leaf from the starbucks which is about probably maybe six kilometers southwest of where Team RR leaves from. So he has stopped riding with the Team RR guys. Of course, but all habits die hard. But I, I've already said to him, but you're right. Nobody wants to see that. In fact, uh, before that incident you saw on the film, I had spoken to Paul H. at the beach house that you saw me briefly film. 
because he had done several similar moves that, that leads to the annoyance of the other road users. And if, because we're on 1097 going across the lake east, 99, all of us on the shoulder, because it's a busy road, even though the shoulder was kind of narrow, but it was safe to use. All of us are using the shoulder. He's in the traffic lane. So you have a, a group of riders. You got 10 people here and one guy just sitting out to the side. You know, what, what is that? And several people had to tell him, you know, get on the shoulder or car back, you know, like with annoyance in their voice, like, you know, get off, you know, get over. There's no reason the shoulder's there. It's clean. It's safe. That's why we're here. We're running a pace line. He just, you know, I don't know, just doesn't seem to care. But yeah, I don't particularly care to ride with him. That one time after that day he rode with Paul and I with all the honking that was going on, I told Paul no more. You know, so anytime he tries, because when we leave the group, he would try to go with us sometimes, and we just discouraged it. But yeah, he just seems to not care, and you know, I, I don't have time. <laughs> so yeah, somebody. Oh yeah, Norway. I've heard, uh, I've read a lot of good things about Norway, other than the fact that you guys get pretty cold for a long period of time. Yeah, you do have some good stuff in there. You know, I think the rest of the world needs to copy these different places we don't we cannot sustain what we're doing here in the houston area we continue to build wider and wider freeways with more lanes and it just really leads to more congestion because you got one person in these five to seven capacity vehicles and it's just not enough you can't build enough roads i mean we we've expanded our 290 northwest freeway we've expanded our katy freeway to where i think we have the most lanes you know, but still, things are not any better really that much because during the busy times, you just have more people using those roads. And they, they have not realized that we need to get people out of cars and get them into mass transit and other modes of transportation. That's the only thing that will alleviate the congestion during the busy hours. You know, so that's... I don't know. It's just uh, they're, they're trying, but it's just too little before you, where you can see. I mean, they, they want to build things like the green belt and other stuff. They need to build cycling roads that go where people want to go. Who wants to go on a green belt? It doesn't go anywhere. You know, not all cycling should be recreational. It should also be functional and practical. You know, that's that's what they're not thinking about. They want to treat it like it's only for recreation. I mean, it's a lot of fun to ride a bike, but you can you can ride to a store or you, you know so people that ride do their best to accommodate you know sharing the road with with cars and so our our local people put signs on the roads that say share the road and all of that instead of just making sure that we are really better accommodated and separated from the faster traffic out there it's uh you know hopefully we'll get around to it but yeah that that's the way to go because then you you get a vehicle like a bicycle that actually makes you healthy when you use it as opposed to a car where you're just sitting and your foot is on one gas pedal you know or whatever and so it's just better to be more active because we have the weather to accommodate that because most of the year our weather is pretty good you know, we have some storms and so forth from, from time to time, but for the most part, we can accommodate that. That's the way you don't we don't we don't need to drive all the time. We should really be encouraged to drive when we're going for longer trips very far away. Because most of our drives, as I said earlier, they're they're under you know, about five kilometers. You go right to the store, put a basket on the bike or something, or put a backpack, pick up a few things. You shouldn't have to drive a car for a lot of the trips that we make. Everything's pretty close. We have enough things close by, you know. So, yeah. So he says, uh, let's see here. Somebody's sharing. We've got uh, <clears throat> Melbourne, Australia has used COVID to allocate more bike lanes in the CBD, inner suburbs, and more dedicated path. We're still a car-centric country here like the U.S., but it's getting better. Well, that's good that they're doing that. I mean, they need to get people out of these cars. We need to do the same thing here because um, it's not getting any better. These guys... Uh, like the local roads that we ride on Saturday during the busy times, they're so small, like our Goslin Boulevard that's nearby. Robert frequents that area too. It's always backed up. 
and now they're starting more construction to add another lane. By the time they're done, it's not going to make any difference during the busy times. You simply have too much of a volume of cars at the same time. It's like a funnel. You put too much water in there, it's going to back up. That, that's what's going on. They, they still haven't figured it out. As long as I've lived in this, this place, they've always been building more roads and with no, very little accommodation for even pedestrian traffic. Just build the roads and they put a sidewalk on a corner and it, it looks pretty and then it goes nowhere. <laughs> you know? So most of the people have to go out of their way if they really want to walk. You know, it's just uh, it's it's unfortunate, but that's that's something that this city needs to work on. A lot of cities in the U.S. need to work on that. Some of them are trying, but not nearly not nearly enough. You know, it's kind of. Um, they can do a lot more so that we can just get out on the bike and not have to be concerned about cars all the time. So what we do here is you probably do the same thing where you are. We plan our routes to look for the quietest r ways to get where we want to go, meaning low volume of cars, less busy roads, cut through neighborhoods. That's kind of what you see even on the weekends. Because we don't want to be sitting in traffic. I don't get on my bike to go sit at a light. I want to be moving. And if they were to accommodate cyclists, the other drivers would see that, hey, these guys are moving. Like if we had enough access comparable to what the cars have, they would see that we're not stopping. You know, we'd be moving while they're sitting in traffic. And it might encourage more of them to get in bikes. And I'm sure that's how it works in other places, you know. It's just it's one of those things they need to work on. So, but as far as uh, what's his name, Michael goes, yeah, they they know, and it's oh, that's Michael. I've mentioned to, uh, to Mark anyway when he used to ride with them. I mean, that's Michael. I've seen him do too many just dumb moves on the road, dangerous, and then annoys the other road users for no reason. So when you ride, you have to be safe. Because if you ride infrequently enough, there's no point taking chances. You're just increasing the risk of getting hit. You can't take risks too often and expect to always beat the odds, you know. So it's kind of like, uh, yeah, we need to be more careful. We need to make sure that we have people in the group that will, you know, set the right example. It, it's kind of, you know. I don't, I, like I said earlier, I don't have trouble with other road users. I'm very cautious when I ride uh, because it just makes sense. It actually works better. There's no, you know, I, I ride my bike like I drive my car. You know, go out there to, you know, increase my chances of getting hit. Welcome. We've got, I think that's Jeffrey. Let's see here. Got a new person here. Yeah, Jeffrey made it. Welcome, Jeffrey. We started out, we're talking about just cycling safety and the lack of accommodations for us on this side of the, the pond, so to speak. But, you know, it's, it's most, a lot of the world, you know, everything's centered around the, the automobile. You know, they just uh, build stuff for cars and they build more roads thinking that would solve the problem. They should know by now it's not going to. Getting more people out in cars is not going to solve the problem. Especially, you know, with, with covid happening like it did people started working from home and all of that so traffic volume i could literally see it in this city when i would go out the busier times were lighter and this and that you didn't have it's the number of people going out at the same time so what they need to do is encourage people to not use cars that often by building paths that make sense the the hike and bike paths we have here are not for in my opinion cycling because first of all you got people walking dogs people pushing strollers people just out hanging out you know it's for it's a, anything but fast riding you can't ride fast on it i even mentioned in my reply to robert's comment about not liking using the shoulders or the paths i only use the paths just to get to a road quietly as accessible to the road and then when i get to the road i start riding because really on the paths you don't want to go very fast because you come up on walkers, joggers, and other people using it. It's not exclusively set up for bicycles. And so really, it's almost akin to trying to use the sidewalk. 
<laughs> which you're not supposed to. We don't. I don't ride on the sidewalk. But it's it, it's very twisty in a lot of areas in, in the area we ride in. And so you got trees in the corners and different. So it's not it's not designed for you to just go, you know, even 18 miles an hour. Let's say uh, uh, 20, 30 kilometers an hour or higher. It's not even designed for you to go that fast on those paths. It's really just for you when you're just kind of chilling and cruising, you know, just chatting. That's what it's for. So it's not really, you know, we get people in the, we have a, a, a an app in our area called Next Door Neighborhood. And people go in there and put comments. And when you comment, it shows what village you live in and everything. So people would make comments about joggers and cyclists being on the road and blah, blah, blah. And then we have people come in. And sometimes I, would, I will reply just to educate them. And some of the people would say, well, they have a right to be there. You know, they have the attitude that, what are you doing using the road? Somebody literally, I'm paraphrasing, but that's what somebody said about a jogger. Why is a jogger using the road? The jogger wasn't in the middle of the road. The jogger was jogging on the, the curb that Robert's talking about, the little shoulder. And so these joggers came onto the app, you know, people that, that know about it, and started educating this one saying that when you're driving a car, you're not the only one out there. They're acting like only cars should be on the road. That's the only thing they should be aware of. <laughs> you know. And, and when I put my two cents in, I said, well, if that were the case, why do you crash into each other anyway? <laughs> because you're not paying attention. I said, the roads is a public utility for all. It's not for cars only. If joggers want to use the side of the road, they have the right to be there. You driving a car is a privilege, not a right. So you need to pay attention when you're driving. Yeah, <laughs> it's an attitude thing and so when they come and post on there if they don't know we try to educate them you know so it's kind of uh yeah somebody said let's see here um kjl said most stuff here is faster to get to by bike but risky to leave expensive bikes anywhere so need to use cheap bikes for those kind of trips but lockable bike containers are starting to pop up yeah, um, you can you can get a bike just for running around. I mean, I, I for one, when I use my road bike to go to the Walmart because I don't want to walk in my cycling shoes. So for that situation, um, you could get like a, a mountain bike, an inexpensive mountain bike, and then get a lock for it. And if you lock it securely, you should be fine. So yeah, um, for just running trips around and different things, I think it's just... Smart. I mean, my, my Walmart is probably two miles from where I live. I shouldn't have to drive there. But, you know, our roads are so set up to where there's not even a curb or an edge to some of the roads. It just drops off into a gutter. You know, you see the roads we ride on the weekend. These are the same roads. We ride from here and head out. In the neighborhood is okay, but even in the neighborhood. Hey, D, D in D.C., thanks for helping the channel. So even in the neighborhood, we have uh, people that try to walk. They have to walk on the street. You guys see us uh, riding in the morning, leaving, and then you see walkers coming and they're on the road. That's not even in nowhere in where I live in my neighborhood do I see a, a sidewalk, period. It's just a road and a curb and grass. And the grass is mostly someone's lawn. And you don't, nobody want you walking on that lawn because there will be a path where the grass will die. So there is no accommodation for pedestrians. So the, the township nearby where we live is called the Woodlands. The Woodlands have gone and chosen to put these paths that are about probably four to maybe four or five, I would say four feet wide thereabouts you know don't i'm not i haven't taken a tape measure but just estimate it's about four feet wide and they go very scenically around trees and so forth real nice so people use that to walk because it, it parallels the road very often but we also can because it's a hike and bike so we ride we can get on there with our bike if we want to if you got like rollerblade skateboard whatever a skateboarder wouldn't want to use that anyway because those those paths get uneven because they're amongst trees and you know the roots of the trees will cause those to buckle in certain places over time so they're not the smoothest paths to use and that's what robert's talking about if you're on a trike or even a bike you're moving 
and then you come across somebody walking a dog, you got to be courteous. So you got to wait. You know, it's not. Yeah, it's not set up like that. So we use those only when we have to to get to other roads that are quieter that we can ride our bikes fast on. That's why we head out of town for a workout. Not just here. Most places. Uh, there's a guy named Christian Colonello. He's from Italy that moved here a few years ago. He rides with us from time to time. And he even said that in Italy, he did not ride in town. He said it wasn't safe. They'd, they'd head out just where you see the racers go, head out to the mountains and other rural roads. Because in the city, the congestion, and you know, you've seen those Italian cities and European cities, the roads are going by in the middle of these buildings. Who wants to ride there where somebody can step out in your path? Are you dealing with cars? Yeah. So they didn't ride in town much for serious fitness riding. They did the same thing we do, you know. And then some of those cities probably, if you're just riding around, they have bike-centric things that would get you around, I'm sure. Yeah. But I, I don't think that uh, they, they, they think about really setting up infrastructure for the average person to choose to just get on a bike and go to the store, pick up something. And that's the way we need to be set up because we have enough. Every neighborhood who has a local Home Depot, Walmart, whatever, that you can go get some screws or whatever. You don't have to drive there all the time unless you hauling lumber or something. <laughs> So let's see here. Uh, Melanin, welcome. It's got to be morning over there. Melanin's in Asia. She said, I've been traveling around, so I just caught up on the Tour de France highlights. Did you talk about the female spectator at the first stage? I heard she got arrested. Yeah, I talked about that. That was, uh, yeah, they didn't do anything. They dropped the charges. I mean, the, the tour decided not to press charges, so they let her go. It wasn't anything intentional. They, you know, it's an accident. It's unfortunate. She was trying to get camera time, you know. Let's see here. KJL. You see here, the drivers like to use, but you guys don't pay road tax. They're idiots. That's all I got to say to that. What, what's road tax? The taxes here come from sales taxes that are used to, to fix the road. You know, we don't pay road tax. So what if you don't pay road tax? You still have the right to use the road. There is no law that says you can't use the utility because you didn't pay road tax specifically. We pay sales taxes. Our sales taxes are used to maintain roads here. When you bought that bike and you paid sales tax on it, in the U.S. at least, it goes to maintain the roads. Road tax alone is not enough. Road tax. They should pay air tax and everything for those cars that pollute the air, too. Robert Tangler says, video from an urban planner why Houston sucks so bad for other road users. I actually saw that. I saw that video, that urban planner video. I watched it a long time ago. Yeah. Yeah. This guy has a channel and he lives in the Netherlands now. Yeah, I saw that. He talked about why Houston. He basically had to get a, take a cab to go 800 meters. <laughs> I mean, that's how poorly the area he was in in Houston was laid out. Yeah, I saw that, Robert. <clears throat> Dean DC says, I don't like using bike paths and have vowed to never use them again. I've had two crashes on paths, and there are often too many dogs and children, also too many inexperienced riders on the path. Yeah, the paths are not for fast riding. I've said that earlier in here and, and at other times. They're really for you having a conversation with a slow rider, or you're just hanging out or whatever, and you're just kind of moving at maybe 10 kilometers an hour or something like that because you got to slow down to accommodate the other users because it's not just for bikes. No, there are countries like the Netherlands that build a bike lane that looks like a road. It's just smaller. It's got a stripe and everything, and I think sometimes they even use a different color in the pavement. That's designed for you to move. That's what I'm talking about. That's what we need. So, no, I don't use – when I get on the bike paths here, it's so Paul and I can chat or we're kind of cooling down to get to another road on the way home. In fact, we choose the bike paths when we just want to hide from the sun because our, most of our bike paths are under trees. And that's another thing about the bike paths here in the, the township of the Woodlands. You got to be careful. When it rains, it's the last thing to dry. And then there's not a whole lot of light because of the trees. So it's always slicker than the road. So when you get on there, you got to slow down. We have a lot of pine needles and leaves and all of that. And you can easily fall. It's, it's treacherous because it's not straight. 
They made it scenic and it curves around trees and it's real pretty and everything, but it is not for going fast. You couldn't even if no one else was there because you got to slow down to go around these really twisty bends that they go through. So no, yeah. That's not what it's made for. It's to get people away out of the house and just hanging out outside. That's why the township did it. They said hike and bike, but it's, it's really for non-vehicular traffic. They, they basically stamped that on the pavement. And then they put a little metal pin at certain intersections to ensure that no motorized vehicles can get in there. It's just little posts. They are removable, but they locked them to where it's in the center of the path and the bike can go around on either side, like almost like a lane marker, to prevent other vehicles uh, that may run on gas or other things. So the only things that you will see there are the maintenance crews that go to trim the trees or the limbs of trees that protrude onto those paths. So no, just, just like you experienced, they're not for that. No, we don't ride fast. And I much rather ride on the road when I'm going fast. There's less to keep up with. You know, people are walking their dogs and other things, and I don't fault them because that's the only solace they have. There's nowhere else. We don't have sidewalks. So where are they going to walk? That's why this township put those paths there. You know, so we need, in addition to these paths, we need sidewalks so you can encourage people to get out of the cars and walk. Right now, it's, it's not accommodating. So nobody looks forward to walking <laughs> you know, because most of the places don't have hike and bike paths. I'm just talking about the woodlands that has invested in those paths. There are places where you've got nothing but a road and a grassy shoulder and a gutter. So you really have to be die hard to walk. My wife and I used to do it. We lived in Champions. We tried to walk, and you had to like go through I don't know what just to, to do a one hour walk. It was a pain. You know, so people people go to a track to walk. I mean, that's ridiculous. You should be walking to go somewhere. You shouldn't go to a track to walk around in circles. Where I grew up, we didn't go for a walk. We just walked. You know, you walked on the way to the grocer. So if you told somebody where I grew up, you're going for a walk, they said, where are you headed? Oh, well, get me, get me a gallon of milk on your way back. Might as well do something while you're out there. Nobody went somewhere and just walked in circles like they do here. But here, they want to relegate you to a reservation to walk. They really That's our mindset. Get them off the road. Put them here to walk. Let them go ride on the green belt. So my, my, my comeback is, let them drive on the freeways. Get them off our streets. <laughs> Let's see how that works. Pick up your car, take it to the freeway before you can drive. How does that work for you? Yeah. Not very practical, is it? Always want to put somebody else. Let's see here. Um... <laughs> yeah, Robert, I saw that. Not just bikes. He has a channel there. It, it, it's, he's got some good stuff there. But he talks about. He said he, why he hates Houston. This says the there is a an urban planner that lives in the Netherlands now. He was able to travel all over the world, so he chose to move to the Netherlands because of what they've done to accommodate non motorized travel. Just just a it's more sustainable. We cannot sustain this. It's too expensive to own a car. Not everybody should be required to. The city should be planned to where if somebody does not want to buy a car, they shouldn't have to. You can take a bus or a train or whatever and then ride your bike the rest of the time. Let's see here. <laughs> Melanin says, uh, yes, London, UK is my home country. Cycling in London is a nightmare and frustrating in London. Yes, yeah, it's probably got the same as here. It can't be any worse than Houston. And um, Melanin says, in London, they should have made an example of that spectator. She's not here for camera time. Well, yeah, I don't know what they're going to do. They, they just, uh, I guess the threat of the lawsuit, she ended up turning herself in there, hoping that people don't copy that going forward. Pablo Lazari. <clears throat> Pablo wants to know what's the best way to get into racing. Um, you just got to go to a race, but before you go, you got to get a training plan and get yourself in decent condition. I would say start riding with a fast group and then see how you hold up because chances are those same people in the fast group are also racers. That's the best way to start. 
But uh, you, you really need to, all the details we'll talk about on here, make sure your bike fits you, get a good training plan or get a coach if you really want to be successful at, at it. But you just got to get out there and ride with faster riders and learn how to ride in close proximity to other cyclists. That's the best way. So if you need more specific help, go to our website on veloharmony.com and look at some of our training plans and we can, we can get you put a program together for you. But that's kind of how you start. <laughs> Robert said the pads are people with headphones. Yeah, a lot of them can't hear you when you come about like the, what Robert's talking about is you will find that as you ride or as you run or on the pads, you come across other users that have their headphones on. And it never dawns on them that they should tune it to where they're able to be aware of what's happening around them. They don't hear you because they've basically blocked out the world, which is just pretty dumb because you're outside. You really need to be cognizant of what's going on around you. And they'll have head plugs in their ears to where they can't hear anything else. They want to block out everything. That's pretty antisocial. You might as well. You should have just stayed indoors on a treadmill. But they can't hear you when you say on your left or whatever. That's what Robert's talking about. They're out there with stuff in their ears. <laughs> Jeffrey says, I'm blessed. I have closed roads on a nearby military post other than an occasionally no traffic. Well, unless those closed roads go very interesting places, you can only do that so much and you'd get bored with it. See, I like to do different things every time I get on my bike and go different places. You know, check out different areas. I've learned so many different neighborhoods on my bike that I would never have encountered in a car because I would have had to have a reason in a car to go there. You know, sometimes my wife and I would go and I would say, oh, let's check out this neighborhood. Let's see. Let's see the kind of houses they got in there. Well, in a car, you wouldn't just get in your car to go do that necessarily. And on a bike, you just feel I feel I remember the journeys better on a bicycle. You feel more connected than in a car. So, yeah, you know, but it's good to have a road that like you're saying that's close. If you're going to do specific workouts like sprints or you know, specific intervals or whatever. But you can still find that on real quiet roads. But I think that as a society, we need to stop accommodating the automobile. The automobile is not something that everyone should be forced to have. It's an expensive thing to have. Alpine Ibex. Are you subscribed to any print cycling magazines? No, I'm not. Long time ago, I had bicycling and uh, Velo News, but that was like in the 90s when I was racing. I used Velo News to keep up with the boys across the pond to see what they were doing. California Rider. I've been riding a steel bike with 650B wheels for a nice change from the road bikes. Well, if, you're, if the steel bike is a road bike, I mean, I, I assume it's a road bike, your steel bike, it's a 650B. That's just a smaller wheel. I'm, I've never used a 650 wheel, so I'm not sure how they ride or anything, but I know a lot of uh, riders, a lot of female riders seem to like the smaller wheels like the, you know, versus the 700C. California writer says headphones with one ear at most. Well, the headphones, um, it doesn't have to be one ear. The headphones can be in both ears as long as they're not plugged in to where you can't hear around you. So, for example, like the regular Apple headphones that you just place in your ear, those work fine because you can hear everything. But it's the ones with the little tips that pop into your ear canal that actually cancel out your ability to hear the world around you. Those are the ones that are dangerous. You can have both of the standard earphones that come with your phones and they'll work fine. Uh, 
Oh, Fort Benning, hundreds of miles. Okay, if you got that many, yeah, then you can definitely mix it up. And chances are it's got to have interesting trees and different scenery over there. So California Rider says the 47 millimeter tires on the 650 drop bar bike, slower but a nice change. Probably more comfortable with that, you know, 47 millimeter tires. Your ride is probably smoother, and uh, chances are you could probably even use some of the gravel paths, some of the dirt paths. Yeah, I, I will I will put on a headphone. Jeffrey says when uh, sometimes he uses what he calls a bone conduction headphone. The ambient sound is hurt. Um, there are times when I will use the standard iPhone headphones, not put anything on. Even if I do put on the music, I still hear everything the same. Cars are very loud. You guys know it. I'm preaching to the choir. When they go by, the internal combustion engine is noisy. That's why they put mufflers on there. And then people go out of the way, down here anyway, the owners of some of these trucks will put straight pipes on there that are even louder. So there's no trouble hearing cars, probably even with the plugs I was talking about. But so, yeah, uh, I'll place those in there because sometimes if I leave here close to lunch and I'm expecting a call or something from someone, a client or something, I will take my headphones and just put them in my ear, route it in my jersey and put them in my ear and they're just there. And I loop them under my helmet strap and they just sit there. I can even play music if I want to, but when I'm cycling for the most part, I just, I like dealing with the outside, the outdoors. So I'll put them in there if I'm expecting a call so that when the call comes in, the, the standard iPhone, the white cord just has a little microphone here, a controller that you, I can take the call while I'm riding. That's when, you know, I'll use that. And that's fine. You can hear everything. That's the way to go. I, you know, and plus, if you have those in your ear that block stuff, they probably tend to be uncomfortable after a long time. They're going on a long ride. Why would you want to do that anyway? But yeah, there's nothing wrong with headphones. Just make sure you can hear around you. Just, just you know, I, you know, I don't use them that often unless, like I said, I'm expecting a call or something, then I'll take them with me. And then sometimes I'll have music going, and then when the call comes, it dubs the music down, and then you can take your call to where you don't have to take the phone. I don't want to hold the phone while I'm writing. So you can hands-free tap that thing down here and just speak, and they can hear you. And I even made a video using that, the video where I said, start your day right, and I was out riding on a quiet road. I used it to make the video because it was connected directly to the phone, and so the audio was better than trying to use the external speakers on a phone on a windy day, which it, it is whenever you're moving on the bicycle. So, yeah, there's nothing wrong with headphones when used correctly. But we, we all need to know that even if you're not riding, like they're talking about, Robert was talking about those joggers, it makes no sense to block out the world when you're out in it. It makes more sense to block out the world when you're in your home and you want to block out sound and you're laying by with headphones and listening to music. Yeah, that makes sense. But out there, you need to know what's going on. If somebody honks a horn or something, you need to be able to hear that because that, that, that might be a warning for you for danger because <laughs> you know, you're out there. You know, So it's, uh, it's something we, we have to, that has to be number one. You're out there, even in your car. We lose, what, 2,000-something people every day motorists and we've just accepted that from the automobile <laughs> you know <laughs> we've gotten used to it but yeah it's okay we there's this invention that transports us but kills a couple of thousand a day yeah, that's that's a sacrifice and no one thinks twice when they get in their car to crank it up because they don't think it's going to be them and so the automobile should be discouraged except when you're making very long trips. That's, that's what I think. They should really discourage it. And there are cities that do that to where the automobile is not encouraged to be used in the city center as much. So you can use it when you're going between cities. 
I think that's the more practical use of the automobile and let people get on trains and other things and park those things. The roads will be clearer. The air will be cleaner. You know. <clears throat> Alpine Ibex. Curious, what is on the top of your cycling-related products wish list at the moment? Hmm. I guess uh, another frame, probably uh, a nice carbon frame, I guess. Yeah, if I'm going to get a carbon frame, I don't want just a carbon frame. Probably something custom from Calfee with the, with the seat angle at 71 degrees or 70 degrees, a 55, 56 with a, like a 59, 60 top tube. Yeah, if, I'm, if I get a carbon frame, it's going to have to be custom because the stuff they're making... They're, they're kind of overpriced, and their, their, their dimensions are not accommodating taller riders very well. We have to shove our saddle so far back just to get it comfortable. And when you're paying good money, there's no reason for it to do that. So, yeah. Other than that, I got enough jerseys. I got enough shorts, caps, everything. I mean, you know, I have things that I list on the website, and I've got to put more things out there. That I'm trying to get rid of things, the demo items that I use in these videos, some of the Rafa stuff and some of the other things like the uh, Prenda Ciclismo jerseys and stuff. They're all sitting in a shop and I need to get rid of them. I got more stuff than I can shake a stick at. So, yeah, it's like cycling stuff. People are always sending me email. They want to send more stuff. And then I push back by saying, send me the link. Let me look at the product. There is some company. Let me see if I can find the email here that wants to send cycling lights to the channel. And the lady who sent the email wanted me to promise to insert. It's, they call it product placement in marketing spiel. Promise to place the products in a video or whatever. So my pushback was, I want to see this product because the link she sent went to like the entire website of what they make and that i didn't have time to pour through all that stuff let's see here i don't see i think it's under customer services trying to find the email if i can remember what the like it's on bike light they, they, they claim they made bike light but they made flashlights bike lights all kinds of stuff why well, don't have to pour through all your products. If you want me to place a product somewhere, send me the link to that specific product. So that was my request last week sometime to her. Send me the specific link. I will review the product and then authorize you to send it if it's something that I think my audience would be interested in. I don't think she'd like that request because I haven't heard from her. It's been a week. It doesn't take a week to send me a link for a product you already have on a website. You know, so... I don't like to get stuff sight on scene. You end up wasting time and just you end up with junk you, you can't use. So there's a lot of stuff out there, but not necessarily something that's practical. So, yeah, so real, real particular I have to be. You can't just take everything. We were um, I'm going to talk about Jersey since you're talking about stuff here. There is a gentleman on here that left a comment. His name is Anun, Anun Kuhn. He was talking about the jersey. People like comparison, and sometimes certain things don't compare. And he was talking about because someone made a comment on the last vi group ride video that, oh, I was on the fence about the jersey you're wearing, the, uh, the Itape jersey I wore last week, Saturday. I was on the fence about it. It looks nice. And then another guy said, oh, I was never on the fence. I really like their stuff. And then this gentleman... I think he's from, I don't know if he's in Asia or not, but his name is Anu Kuhn or something like that. So he said uh, he liked the La Passion lightweight and wanted to know, you know, I think somehow I had said I, I favor the Rafa flyweight. And then he said, well, you had said that the La Passion was, was more breathable or whatever. I said, yeah, that may be the case. I said, but, you know, when you generally, I'm paraphrasing, when you pick something as a favorite, you weigh all the pros and cons. You can't compare two different things 
a hundred percent. There are always going to be variances. So what I told him was, what I like about the flyweight is I don't have to treat it like a chicken egg. I use it, I toss it in the washer with all the other jerseys and hang it up. There's no piddling. It doesn't come apart. As opposed to La Passion, where I, at the time, I, I've griped about it on this channel. They didn't even specify, you know, clearly, easily to find that you needed to put this in a garment bag to wash and all that. It's too fragile. And, and that comes with it. So... I explained to him, that's the reason the flyweight is my favorite because the first La Passion came apart. It started developing holes in the lightweight fabric. Because if you don't wash it by itself in a garment bag, just by it being among other jerseys, it started getting holes. I mean, you know. So I told him, I said, yeah, it's too fragile. And then, then the quality is different. That's what I told him. And the price dictates that. The, the Rafa and just like the La Passion, you can load up the pockets but I like the Rafa because you can load it up just use it like a regular jersey and it breathes really well so for this time of year right now as humid as it has been I just use the, the flyweight and other like the Suki jerseys are very light that's what you have to use it makes a big difference in you being comfortable out there and he was more set on me doing a comparison and they're not the same I said and it's evident in the pricing <laughs> that's it you know, you, when you buy a Ferrari, you're paying for a hell of a lot more engineering than what you find in a Corolla, and they have different purposes. That's just the way it is. If you're not in the market for that, you stick with that one. Don't worry about a Ferrari. Buy the Corolla and enjoy it. <laughs> you know, that's, that's, that's just the way it is. Let's see here. Um, California Rider, do you think rim brakes will make a comeback getting harder and harder to find? Rim brakes haven't gone anywhere. You guys are just being suckered into buying what the vendors are choosing to put on their shelves. Yeah, that's just what they're doing. That's what they're pushing. Yeah, you know. But uh, the, the disc brakes are good for the repair market because they need more care. So the shops like them because you're going to be there often for a mechanic to adjust your brakes when they start, when they warp. You got some people break too long, too hard. The discs, depending on the quality of the discs, they warp. So they need more care, especially if you have hydraulic brakes. Um, so, yeah, they, they're just a bit too finicky. I don't like to be fiddling with brakes all the time. I got spoiled with the rim brakes. You just set them and you, you just go. So, yeah, the rim brakes are out there. Depends on what frames you want to get. A lot of people just go to a shop or one vendor. If that's all they're carrying, yeah, they'll sell that to you. But it's your money. You need to say what you want. That's really what it is. So what's happening is since no one's saying anything, they're just buying it. Yeah, they're going to keep making it. I mean, nothing wrong with them. They're just breaks. You know, they're not that big a deal. I don't know when it became that important. <laughs> I'm more focused on how my bike fits me and all that. I don't worry about how I stop it. My problem is getting it to go fast. <laughs> so, yeah, um, they're out there. Yes, they're harder and harder to find because the vendors are buying what the manufacturers are pushing. That's all that is. So if I were to get a bike, it would have to be custom because I want to dictate. I want I will get probably the direct mount rim brakes that go into the stays. And then I would definitely be getting a shallow seat tube in my size with a longer top tube, which they don't make anymore. They used to do that. You know. So it's kind of um They've reduced the amount of sizes. That's why you got small, medium, or medium, large. You know, I can one frame fit that huge of a range of people that are making you get a longer seat post or a longer stem so they don't have to build that many sizes of frames. Uh, D in DC say, in a pace line, how do you deal with cyclists who have inefficient pedal stroke that cause their bike to surge a slight changes in speed. There's always uh, slight changes in speed. So um, it doesn't, I wouldn't call it inefficient. You, you, you have a point there, but it really doesn't matter. You, you have, if you watch our tapes, our films, uh, and in fact, with the power now, I think it's easier to see. If you watch the film, the power on the right, you will see that number kind of flicker lower because I'm always soft pedaling. You just have to turn off the power. That's the whole point of being in the draft. So you're following a rider and they slow down for whatever reason, your point notwithstanding. Whatever's causing them to slow down, you should be able to feel the deceleration because you can sense them kind of 
coming back to you. And at that moment, you just soft pedal and you drift a little to the side. That's how you deal with that. That's normal. There is no one constant speed because you're following very closely so that the speeds will change for different reasons. Imperfections in the pavement, the rider's reaction to a crack or something will cause them to hesitate. That's normal. And those are the things you must master and be comfortable with if you're going to do any mass event, like a grand fondue or whatever. It's not only because they're inefficient or whatever. Whatever's causing that speed to deviate, you soft pedal, you slip to the side, let the wind slow you down. So it makes it easier for the person behind you. That's why we don't brake. That's why all this thing about braking is overblown. We are told not to use your brakes in the pace line. You won't be very popular. You're braking in the pace line all the time. People will frown on you because the brakes take off too much speed versus coasting or drifting, let the wind or friction slow you down. So yeah, you have to get used. That's part of pace line riding. It is never one perfect speed. That's what makes it interesting. And then what ends up happening is by you saving all that energy by soft pedaling for all those kilometers, when it's time to really put the hammer down, you're fresh versus when you ride solo where you're just on there all the time. You, you don't get the back off if you're trying to really work that day. Those, those are, in my opinion, those are benefits. You know, just, you know, being able to accommodate the changes in speed. You do it by feel. You know, it's part, you, know you can just tell. Like, a, you know, the, we'll talk about the little yo-yo effect. And you should be able to drift right or left, slow yourself down and wait, and then boom, it goes. There's always an acceleration and a slowdown, especially when someone pulls off the front. If somebody's pulling off the front, there's a slight acceleration sometimes when the next guy takes over. And a lot of times we try to get them to not accelerate too much, you know. It's kind of, you know, but yeah, that, that's part of group riding. That's part of pace line riding. That's, that's what you have to get accustomed to. It doesn't matter whether you've ridden with them or not. You, you have to be able to get, get, get accustomed to that. You should be, after, over, after a while, you will be able to tell where your wheel is versus theirs without even looking at the wheel, just sensing where the rider is peripherally. You should be able to tell whether you're too close or you're overlapping and all that. That's why I get annoyed at our pros like in the tour. They, they fall too frequently. They're just a little too lackadaisical about it, about their safety. You know, I know the young kids and everything, but they take too many chances. You're professionals, man. Show us by example. They're always hitting the deck. Some of their crashes are truly avoidable. Somebody put a cardboard sign in front of me. I doubt if I'm going to fall. That cardboard is going to, I will hit the cardboard, but I'm not going down. So I don't understand what these guys are doing. Like that sign the lady put out there. I don't know why it brought him down. That's a cardboard sign. So I don't know. He probably wasn't paying attention. So some of that, some of that falls are like, eh, come on, guys. We all ride bikes. You know, like a bunch of pick featherweights. They act like, yeah, yeah. You know. <laughs> it doesn't take much to bring them down. <laughs> Let's see what Patrick is saying here. He said, I use Aftershock's bone conduction earphones. Absolutely brilliant. Good sound. Waterproof and easy operation. Can still hear everything around me. Aftershocks. I've never heard of those. Let me see here. J West, welcome. Let's see here. Better late than never. Let me share this screen here. Let's go over here. We're going to find this after shots these guys are talking about. And this is the thing I like. I'm all, I always have an open mind. I never um, act like I know it all. That's the mindset you need to have. You should always be learning. Every time I get on my bike, I learn something new about myself, my training, because it's all dynamic. Let's put in here after shot S H O K Z twenty twenty one. Oh no, that's this one. After shots headphones. Okay, there they are. Walmart has it for a hundred dollars. Is it ninety nine ninety five? Let's go to their website. I like the the way it looks. It looks like we fit well under a helmet. Let's see here. 
and it looks very secure. I wish they would send one to the channel so I can test this bad boy. That would be cool. Yeah, anything that allows you to hear around you, that's a plus. Because, I'm, you know, sometimes it, it helps to have a nice track of music during your intervals to spur you on, you know, to squeeze out that last effort. So, yeah, let's see here. They've got a new site that says newest is open calm. Um, let's see. Let's learn more about the open calm. I'd want something to where I could take phone calls. Yeah. So this one is the Bluetooth headset. Okay, so that would work. Pair it to your phone. Noise canceling, boom mic, open air comfort, 16 hours of talk time. That's good. Quick charge. Let's see. I wonder if they've got, yeah, somebody's wearing it. Oh, this one is, okay, a little different. It's got like a mic in there, so that's good. It's probably not the one you're talking about, right? Let's see here. Okay, what he's talking about, the Aeropex. I just saw that, Larry. Let me go to learn more about this one, the Aeropex. Okay. Uh, most of our wireless headphones, you know, for premium sound, long lasting to keep you in motivated or power training workout. Now, does the Aeropex allow you to, to talk, though? I'd want something to where if a call comes in while I'm listening to music, I can talk. Because I always have my phone in my jersey or somewhere. It doesn't look like it does. Let's see. This is mostly for listening, it looks like. Let's go back a little bit. Let's see the Mini here. The Aeropex Mini. Uh, This, the Aeropex has the eight-hour battery life. At least I'm looking at the Mini here, endurance headphones. Oh, Jeffrey says all of them allow calling. Okay, cool. So that means it must have a built-in microphone. I really should put it over here. Let's see what's on the technical stuff. Go back. says how it works. What is bone conduction? Bone conduction is the transmission of sound vibrations to the inner ear, the cochlear, bones of the skull, which allows you to perceive the sound without blocking the ear canal. Cool. Even more simply put, the sound that is delivered directly to your inner ear without needing to pass through the eardrum. Think of bone conduction as a shortcut to hearing sound. Interesting. So as far as it says, the, the audio enters the transducer. It has two transducers on either side. Those transducers positioned near the cheekbone work to convert audio signals into mechanical energy, which are vibrations, which are sent to your cheekbones. And the titanium makes the conduction seamless. They're converted into audible sound, those vibrations. Cool. I'm looking at where it says that you can receive calls. That's what I'm curious about. Let's see here. I see this one with open calm on here, but that's like more for a call center kind of setup. The Aeropex looks really sleek. That's the one that goes. I like that it goes around the back of your head, so it's not going to fall off while you're riding. Yeah, so Larry says the mic is there. Okay, cool. This is something that... Uh, What's his name? I was asking about my list. <laughs> I'm going to put it on my list. <laughs> What's his name? I think it was it. Was it Jay West that asked about it? And I think it was Alpine. Ibex. <laughs> this would be nice to have. That's nice. Because, you know, sometimes you're on a ride and people call. And a lot of times I can't get to it. So that's kind of nice. So let's see here. It's cheaper to talk to myself and never have an argument this is Jay West's boy. I think he's in Atascacita, if I remember. 
J. West missed his calling. He should be a comedian. He said, it's cheaper to talk to myself and never have an argument and hear nothing but pure cadence. <laughs> Alpine, my third question, feel free. You'll ignore short torso, long hands. Long hands, you mean long arms. I think that's what you mean. Will the length of the hand play a role selecting the right reach? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes. Alpine, uh, Alpine your, your, um, your reach are the, your, there are three contact points, and then we'll come back to the headphones. Where you sit, that's your seat height, and then your fore aft, getting that saddle under you correctly, because you can have the right height and be uncomfortable if you're not sitting in the right spot on the saddle. And then your, your pedal contact, meaning putting that cleat under the widest part of your foot. It's not as simple as it sounds. It's a science, remember? Then the third thing is how you reach your bars. Well, how do you reach your bars? Your arm. So you said hands. It's your arm length. It's your, your reach is your arm length. So you measure from your shoulder to where you're going to reach the bars. That gives you your reach. That's important because if it's not right, you set that independently of your saddle. So a lot of riders make the mistake of moving a saddle. Oh, I want to get closer to the bars. No, the saddle has nothing to do with your reach. You set the saddle and the cleat first. Then you set where your bars need to be versus where your arms want them to be. So, yeah. Uh, so I think you meant arms, not hands. As far as hands go, the larger hands you have, you want to use deep drop bars, which give you more space in there. Normal size. Yeah, I mean, what's normal? Everybody's got different size hands. So smaller hands use shallower bars. It's more comfortable. My hands are big, so I don't like shallow bars. They just don't feel right. I like all that space. We call them deep drop bars. Let's see here. Larry says they are really they are really lightweight but seem perfect for a bike helmet. Yeah, just looking at it, Larry, they do look like they would be perfect because I'm looking to see where they have pictures of people wearing them. But the first one I saw looked like it was on the back of the head. And looking at the styling, it would be out of the way. This will go around your ear and this will go around the back of your head, which is where that rock lock things. It's up here in the bottom of, like, my helmets. I can extend the cage back to the lobes on the back of my head. So it cradles my head. And that would not get in the way. I think it would be perfect. Let's see here. They don't seem to have a lot of models wearing the thing. <laughs> uh, yeah, we got this guy. Okay, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. You see, in, in this picture here, where it is kind of like above... Almost like where the neck meets the base of the skull. Let's go back. Where the neck meets the base of the skull. That, that's out of the, 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 the range of the helmet. So that's perfect. Because your helmet will be a little above there. My rock, my rock lock stuff on some of my helmets cradle right here where you see this little lump on the back of his head. They cradle that perfectly. So this thing would not interfere with your helmet at all. It may, it may bug your glasses when they go over your earlobe because they're competing for that little space there. But I don't know. That depends on your style of the glasses you have. <laughs> Jeffrey says, my only complaint is the tan line on my cheeks. Oh, in front of you. I guess you mean, well, I don't know what, what model you have. I'm not sure. Because looking at this guy, is right in front of the earlobe, unless you've got the one that I was looking at with that little thing coming down. I don't know. It shouldn't interfere with your cheeks themselves. Jeffrey, I don't know which, which model you have. Do you have the Aeropex? So what Patrick is saying here, uh, you're welcome, Alpine. Patrick is saying that uh, the mid-range after Shaw's, I guess it's Shock's, it probably shocks and up all have dual mics. The U.S. site is remiss that it doesn't mention call answer and easy one. Exactly. You're right about that. They're not even trying to sell this stuff. I mean, all this. I'm looking on here. You guys are giving me more information than they have on their website. And this is what I talk about all the time. Why put up a website and leave out information? Is there a restriction on how much stuff you can have on your website? I mean, come on, man. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, yeah, yeah, Larry. Yeah, you're right. From looking at the picture on here, yeah, it's definitely well below the helmet. So Patrick is saying this tech was first used in the Gulf Wars by the Special Forces. Larry has the Arapex. Okay. Directly in front of my ears. Yeah. I mean, if that's if it's like the picture here I'm looking at, I don't think I worry about the tan lines there. <laughs> I wouldn't worry too much about it. I guess it does look odd. Like, okay, what exactly are you hiding in that spot to get tan there? <laughs> uh, oh, man. I would probably most likely use something like that when I ride solo. And like I said, I'm expecting a call or whatever. But yeah, that that I like the minimalist design. But they need to try to sell this product better. You guys have done a better do job of salesmanship than they do on their website. I mean, I ended up with more questions than answer when I got to the website. How do you not give the features of your product on your website? That doesn't encourage people to close the sale, you know. So yeah, that's cool. That would be something to check out. I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and tab this page and save that and check it out. But um, we'll go ahead and wrap up today. Uh, you guys, uh, it was great. We appreciate the feedback. D and DC, thanks for supporting the channel. We appreciate your your super chat and the Alpine Patrick. I'm glad you guys could join us today. J West, boy, sorry you came a little late, but better late than never. And what I'm trying to do is I think this is a better day, Thursday, uh, for our, our weekly stuff. Other than the week of the 9th, I, I think I may be able to do it on Thursday. The week of the 9th, uh, the family is having a short vacation. I will update you guys. Um, we should still have our group rides a week before and the week after. But during that week, um, I may not be able to do this live thing. I have to get our itinerary together first. Yeah. And Larry said they are so light where you forget you have them on. Yeah, that's good to know. We'll love to look into that, check it out. Yeah. Well, guys, have a great evening and be safe out there and uh, look forward to the next video. Next week, what we're doing is we started a kind of a pilot test. I ran the idea about Robert Tangler and a few other people, and uh, we're doing the video releases to where I sit like this during the group ride video when we introduce them to the channel every Tuesday. But only the members can chat, but everybody can join. So starting next week, we're not going to be releasing the video on the channel. We'll be releasing it through our live members chat only. You will have access if you're not a member. You just won't be able to chat. So the members don't chat a whole lot. We just sit and we watch. And I sit here drinking a Coke or coconut water or whatever it is I'm doing. And then we... I answer questions like I do right now if they have any about the ride or, you know, but it's mostly about the ride, just that kind of stuff. But for the most part, we just kind of watch the film together live. And we're starting that next week. So you look for the notification. It will say members only. I ran the pilot two weeks, but I also released the film for everybody else. But then starting next week, what we'll do is one release in this live session to where we pipe it through here. And this will release it to everybody else at 5.30, the same time. But this way, we're kind of getting our members to get their kudos for supporting the channel. So I want to thank all of you. Until next time, be safe out there and make sure you get your case in to keep those doctors fired.